is 1513. It is Easter Sunday. A weary European in full battle dress wades ashore from a ship's boat near present-day St. Augustine. Before his feet are out of the water, he's heard to exclaim, Oh my God! It could have been an Easter prayer. It could have been completely involuntary. There was nothing else to call it. Place of flowers. La Florida. This man sure didn't miss it. You're listening to the second movement of Florida Suite by Frederick Delius, a mid-19th century composer and sometime resident of Florida, who came here from Yorkshire, establishing himself up to St. John just below Jacksonville, where he raised oranges for a while. Hear the meandering St. John's in all its mystical magnetism. William Bartram got an eyeful. He undertook a field trip to Florida in 1777, just over a century before Delius. His detailed reports amount to the first exhaustive accounting of the flora and fauna of the peninsula. You could say exhausting. He did it all on foot. His language is full of wonder. Listen. Drawing near the high shores, I ascended the steep banks where stood a venerable oak an ancient Indian field, verdured over with succulent grass and checkered with coppices of fragrant shrubs, nearly encircled an open forest of stately pines, through which appears the extensive savanna, secure range of the swift roebuck. My friends, we're not alone, we who come to this place of perpetual sunshine and wonder, from other places, other lives, and never want to leave. We who call Florida home with much gratitude. And closer to our own times, from Miami, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas sure saw it. She got her beloved River of Grass recognized as Florida's first national park, that sprawling wildlife incubator, the Everglades. From Cross Creek, Marjorie Kennan Rawlings fixed our sights on a quiet corner of the northern part of the peninsula, where a certain nearly tamed yearling of the wild Florida scrub captured our hearts. And right here in Sanford, my friend and neighbor, the naturalist author Bill Belleville, after extolling the beauty of our own river of lakes, that meandering St. John's, talks of the wrenching experience giving up his beloved cracker house to the bulldozer and losing it all to sprawl. Which brings us right up to the issue of the day for us who came and stayed and for our children. The name says it all, Florida Hometown Democracy, genuine grassroots movement to keep Florida, Florida, the place most of us freely chose above all others for its unparalleled natural beauty and promise of unmatched quality of life. Florida Hometown Democracy is sponsoring an amendment, Amendment 4, to the Florida Constitution, guaranteeing direct voter input for future development schemes in our neighborhoods. Over a million signatures have been collected statewide to date, putting us on a ballot for the upcoming November elections this year. And what is Amendment 4? Well, here's what it's all about. Our communities are governed by a series of land use plans that map out our future for ourselves and for our children. With Amendment 4, voters, residents themselves of the communities affected, why, we get to decide whether or not to accept changes our plans, such as arise from time to time, in the meantime, local officials have been making those decisions for us on their own. Lacking real input from us, it has not been a rewarding experience. And what's a comp plan? In 1985, Florida enacted its Growth Management Act after a decade of debate and experimentation. It was a good idea. It aimed at putting the reins on Florida's explosive helter-skelter growth. 
The Act maintains statewide comprehensive planning, along with Oregon, one of the first in the nation to do so, a model for other states. All of Florida's nearly 500 municipalities and 67 counties are required to submit plans for their visions of what their neighborhoods should look like in the long run. The plans are submitted for approval to the state's Department of Community Affairs, which monitors them and conducts re-evaluations of them every seven years. Comp plans specify how we want to use the land residential, commercial, industrial, and so forth. They set limits on how many stories high we want our buildings to be and how many people to pack into a given area. Overall, the object of these targets, should we need to be reminded, is really very simple. Growth in appropriate places around available services. So, okay, what happened? Well, at least one measure reflects a mollifying trend. In the five years following the act, housing starts dropped to half their monthly rates. Of course, the recession of the early 90s played into that. But then the pace resumed and by, by 2005, it hit 25,000 starts per month. Did all that planning have no effect then? So let's have a look at our raw population figures. Wow. As everyone knows, that's been off the charts. Already at 12 million when the Growth Management Act came into play in 1985 and nothing to arrest the skyrocketing curve. Developers and their friends in public office routinely point to these numbers to defend hands-off development here. Hey, we're only keeping up with demand. What could be sounder reasoning? Just this. It chooses to ignore the very thing attracting these people to Florida in the first place. I say people, not numbers on a page. High density development that obliterates the space, the view, the very air we breathe here, violates the lives of those already here and affixes a heavy cap on the continued sustainability of such development, as current events amply attest. Notice at the lower left, most of our population is concentrated in just four regions across the state, places where growth management is most sorely needed. Is there not a way to accommodate people living here alongside preservation of a here worth living in? We think there's a way. Is it not worth every Florida citizen's energy to give continued input to this question? We think it is.